All right, everyone. So we have a jam packed session today. So I'm just going to start and as folks are being let in from the waiting room, they'll just hop in during my um, housekeeping. But welcome to our research in the Delaware River Basin Lightning Talks session. Um, my name is Olivia Warren. I'm with the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed and I have some brief housekeeping for you all. Um, so number one, this session is being recorded and it will be shared on the CDRW website sometime within the next few weeks. Um, attendees as they're being entered are muted by the host. So if you'd like to share, um, please enter it in the chat box. If you're having any technical issues, please message me directly in the chat box. Again, my name is Olivia Warren. Um, and you can see the rest of the forum schedule at Delaware River Watershed Forum .com, uh, or dot sketch .com, And I will include that link in the chat at the end of this session. And that is also where you can provide feedback for the wonderful panelists that we're about to have. And with that, I'm going to toss it over to Roland. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, I'm Roland Wall. I'm the director of the Patrick Center for Environmental Research at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. Uh, apologies, I don't have the virtual backdrop, but uh, it was very pixelating, so I'll only be on screen for a sec, so please bear with me. First, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's session on research in the Delaware Basin. Uh, today, we're going to be presenting a series of lightning talks uh, that will highlight a sampling of important research being conducted on natural and some human processes in the Delaware watershed. I want to thank our partners at the Coalition for inviting us to be part of the forum and to conduct today's session. I also want to thank our, our, the researchers who are presenting today for taking the time to, to be with us. For the past five years, with funding from the William Penn Foundation, the Academy of Natural Sciences has had the opportunity to manage the Delaware Watershed Research Fund. This portfolio of grants supports a range of research in a variety of disciplines that are being conducted by universities, government agencies, and other scientific organizations, all towards a common goal of building capacity and understanding and managing the myriad of systems that are at work in the Delaware River Basin. Our speakers today include grantees from the program, as well as researchers from the Academy of Natural Sciences who have been working uh, in, in similar space uh, within the Delaware River Watershed Initiative and other research. Many of these presenters will also be participating in the fourth annual Delaware Watershed Research Conference that will be presented virtually this year on October 22nd. We hope the presentations today will whet your appetites and that you'll be able to join us for that conference as well. Again, thanks to the coalition, thanks to William Penn for their support in this work, to our, our presenters today, and thanks to all of you for joining us. To moderate today's discussion, it's my pleasure to turn things over now to my colleague, Dr. Marie Kurtz. Marie is head of the biogeochemistry section at the Patrick Center and also an assistant research professor in the Department of Biodiversity, Earth and Environmental Sciences at Drexel University. So Marie, it's all yours. Great, thank you. Well, thank you guys all for attending. I think without further ado, we'll kick off our research lightning talks. So if we can head to our next slide. Our first presenter comes from Villanova University. It's Lesmus Alejandro Moros Jerez, and he'll be talking about lessons learned from monitoring of five headwater streams in Delaware County. Lesmus, please take it away. Uh, good afternoon. I'm happy here to talk about the lessons learned from monitoring five headwater streams in Delaware County. I've been working with Dr. Welker, Dr. Smith, and Dr. Kemp. Next slide. So one of the main problems is that there is a exponential growth of urban development that could imply the increase of impervious surface area that ultimately led to increase the amount of stormwater runoff that can be discharged into water systems. And this can impact biological communities as well as the amount of sediment that is moving from upstream through downstream. Next slide. So one of the research approach of this project is to study each level of the stream function pyramid in order to determine how each of these levels can be related with um, the impact of the stream health under different uh, rainfall X scenarios. In fact, we are collecting data from the hydrological, hydraulic, geomorphological, physical, chemical, and biological level. Next slide. There are five monitoring sites. Two of them are located uh, upstream and downstream of the impacted stream, which is Crown Run. Also, there is a control site located in this small run and to reference sites located in Dix Run as well as Rocky Run in Media, Pennsylvania. Next slide. 
At your left, you can observe the meteorological station that we have, and we collect the rainfall uh, amount. And at the right, you can observe how the um, in-stream monitoring station looks like. We observed the location in previous slide, but here we are saying um, just the station, and we are collecting in, in continuous data from the stream, such as electrical conductivity, temperature, flow rate, depth, and the soft oxygen concentration. Next slide. Uh, also, we go to the stream and we collect uh, samples from uh, on their base flow and store flow conditions in order to determine total nitrogen, total phosphorus, uh, total suspended solids, as well as pH and other water quality parameters. Uh, we estimate those by analyzing those samples in the water resources lab at Villanova University. Additionally, we go to the stream and we collect a sample from the stream bed in order to determine the grain size distribution, as well as we evaluate the, bio, uh, the biological communities from each of the studied stream by performing electrofishing and microinverter rate counts. Next slide. Now, in terms of preliminary results for this research project, uh, we estimated the stream flashing index, which is a ranking to which allows us to evaluate uh, what is the hydrological response of the stream under different rainfall -like scenarios. Um, based on this estimation, uh, we found that the stream flashing index tends to be higher when the watershed in terms of total impervious surface area is higher too, while the stream flashing index tends to decrease when the total impervious surface area is smaller. Next slide. Regarding the geomorphological aspect of this research project, we found by using an aggregation degradation model that uh, the chrome run uh, could uh, produce erosion upstream, uh, specifically 0.2 meters of incision upstream, and the, uh, the system can recover this equilibrium around 180 meters downstream. However, we are still working on this uh, geomorphological aspect in order to determine uh, other variations in terms of erosion at deposition. Next slide. And now I want to acknowledge C. Grant as well as William Penn Foundation, Villanova University College of Engineering, and a University of Baltimore, as well as all the grad, undergrad, intern, and staff at Villanova University, and all the people that allow us to set up our monitoring, street, uh, monitoring stations next to the streams that we are studying. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Lesmus. Um, for those entering, just in the interest of time, we're gonna hold questions to the end of the session. Um, so next up, we have Kelly Smalling from the USGS, who will be talking about point and non-point sources of endocrine disrupting compounds and their potential effects on fish and frogs and the New Jersey pine lens. Kelly, please take it away. Thanks, Marie. So I first want to thank my co-PIs who are actually out in the field right now collecting our remaining fish samples for the project. I got my reprieve because I'm here with you guys today. So today I'm going to briefly touch on ongoing research designed to address the presence and potential effects of endocrine disrupting compounds or EDCs in streams, lakes, and wetlands throughout the New Jersey pinelands. Next slide, please. Oops. Yes. Next slide, please. Scientists often throw around a lot of different terms to define compounds that are not currently regulated, including emerging contaminants, contaminants of emerging concern, EDCs, endocrine acting compounds, et cetera, which really can get to be a bit overwhelming. So we focused on EDCs. And out there in the literature, there's many different definitions, but they're really focused on human health. So the USGS adopted definitions from the WHO, EPA, NIEHS, and others with an emphasis on fish and wildlife, as you can see here on the screen. The bottom line, EDCs interfere with the endocrine system, but that affects many different organismal processes from development all the way up to immune response. Next slide, please. Examples of EDCs are listed here. And what's important is they can be the either natural or man-made or synthetic. So the predominant sources of, of EDCs are, are wastewater, 
urban stormwater runoff, septic systems, animal agriculture, and crop production. There are others, but these are what we predominantly focus on. Next slide, please. The potential observed effects of EDCs include alteration of population sex ratios to more females instead of a 50-50-ish mix of male and female, uh, male intersex, and immune suppression, including parasites, tumors, lesions, et cetera. Next slide, please. In the current study, we're focused on the effects of both point and non-point sources on fish and frogs. For the point sources, we selected two wastewater treatment plants and sampled two sites above and, two sites and one site below. We also sampled two reference or unimpacted forested locations. We sampled several species of fish one time from each location and assessed them histologically. For the non-point source sites, we selected 13 wetlands that had been previously designated as reference or degraded based on land use. Green frogs were collected once and assessed for sex ratios, intersex, and parasites. All sites were sampled for over 140 EDCs four times during the study in the surface water. Next slide, please. We're still working through the results, but this slide just highlights the estrogens that were observed throughout the study. Again, we're still gathering and interpreting the re remaining chemistry data because there is a lot. Um, but here we show that we observed a variety of estrogens at all sites, including both plant and animal est estrogens, including estrone and progesterone. And concentrations varied across our study area. Our reference ponds had fewer estrogens compared to their degraded wetland counterparts as expected. For the point source sites, at first glance, we don't see much of a difference between the upstream and the site downstream of the wastewater treatment plant. And that really could be due to upstream land use. None of these sites were forested. They were all in suburban or urban development. So we probably have non-point sources as, as a source of estrogens in these areas. Next slide, please. Histologically, we had high parasite loads in many of our green frogs and surprisingly only one intersex male, which is a good thing. We still haven't analyzed our sex ratios yet, so that's to come. We collected darters from a stream upstream and downstream of wastewater treatment plants and, and observed no intersex, so they were not sensitive to our estrogens. Sunfish below the wastewater treatment plant had higher prevalence of intersex compared to those collected upstream. And we're currently working through hundreds of histological slides and hope to have more data soon. Our next steps include detailed analysis of chemistry, comparisons across site with land use, finishing up our histology and compiling our biological data and lastly, writing a report. Next slide. I just wanna thank all our field crew that's been out there for the last three years. It's been very intensive and we're gonna have a lot of great data. So come back in October and check it out. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Kelly. So next up in our lightning lightning round, we have Nancy Lawler from the Muskinekong Watershed Association. Um, she will be telling us about revisiting the Muskinekong after 10 years. Nancy? Sure. Next. <laughs> so the Muskinekong River is the largest tributary of the Delaware in New Jersey, and it's very popular for recreation. In general, it's got excellent water quality, except it's contaminated with high fecal bacteria, like many rivers in New Jersey. Um, a TMDL was, de was developed in the early 2000s that states that the bacteria needed to be reduced by 97% to meet New Jersey water quality standards. Um, so what needed to be done to fix it for recreational use? Next. In 2000, um, our partner, North Jersey RCND, used a 319 grant to have Rutgers University collect data to determine what we should do. So they looked at high bacteria levels and they tried to determine what the source might be on a nine mile section of this 30 mile TMDL area. While Canada geese and beaver were certainly possible sources, the land use, the pattern of very high bacteria and PCR studies suggested it was likely to be cow or septic in origin. A watershed, uh, watershed restoration plan 
directed the next 10 years of work. Farmers were encouraged to adopt various um, agricultural best management practices, such as manure management, riparian buffer restoration, and cover crops. And a septic education program was started for residents. Next. So after all these years of work, we wanted to understand what the current bacterial level was so that we can understand what to do next. Um, and, and really what BMP, um, BMPs were, were working. Um, so we partnered with Montclair State University this time to start to figure it out. And in 2018, um, we monitored bacterial levels for six months um, and used qPCR to determine what the sources were. Um, we also did a land analysis to determine the effectiveness of different BMPs. And since we were trying to figure out how to um, scale up regionally, we interviewed uh, various stakeholder groups to determine what motivates people to adopt conservation practices to improve water quality and what are their limitations. Next slide. So what did we find? So in tributaries where the farmers installed uh, manure management practice in addition to other BMPs, we actually found that E. coli levels dropped by over 90%. And in those areas, the qPCR indicated a complete absence or very low presence of bacteria DNA markers attributed to live livestock. Next, stop. Next slide. But in areas where there was dense housing, bacteria had actually increased. And in these areas, the bacteria showed um, a lot of um, bacteria with, high, with human origin, and that indicated failing septics. So next. So if we are really going to um, address fecal bacteria regionally, can we use best management practices to scale it up? Um, and the interviews with stakeholders showed that knowing what to do is really not the issue nor, frankly, is motivation. The farmers, for example, know what the right thing to do is and do take a ver various um, actions to, um, to uh, address it over, over time. Um, voluntary efforts really work, but to scale up, they really need um, coordinated efforts, and that's mostly needed from the NGO and government sector and that requires staff and time. Um, so really from the farmer's point of view, the limitations center around the lack of policy for non-point source pollution that originates upstream and off farm. So stay tuned for our, uh, our complete study um, at the, um, at, uh, through ANS. Um, but our next steps are basically, we're gonna continue the study looking at areas upstream and I'm happy to say that we were recently awarded a 319 grant by New Jersey to address that issue. So upward and onward. Great. Next up. All righty. Thank you, Nancy, for that. Um, next up, we have Peter Claggett, um, also from the USGS, and he'll be talking about his work quantifying floodplain ecological processes in ecosystem services. And hopefully, Peter, we've still got you online. Yes, and um, next slide, please. Yeah, this is a collaborative project. We have a lot of researchers. Uh, Chrissy Hopkins is leading this with Greg Noe. Uh, Emily Pendilli is doing the economic analysis. And basically what we're doing is trying to quantify the sediment and nutrient fluxes on floodplains and uh, within stream banks. And doing that, for a network of field sites, and then extrapolating the information from those field sites to non-monitored sites, so we can have a comprehensive assessment of sediment and nutrient fluxes in floodplains throughout the Chesapeake Bay and the Delaware River watersheds. Um, and then once we have those fluxes, the, the gains and the losses uh, quantified, then we can assign values, economic dollar values, um, to the role that floodplains play in retaining uh, sediment and nutrients 
based on kind of the costs and what we already pay for um, that work to be done at wastewater treatment plants. Next slide. So what we did to um, one, build this network of field sites, Greg Milley, uh did that uh, to quantify the sediment and nutrient fluxes at all these various sites. And then we used LIDAR information and built a tool to extract fluvial geomorphic data, data on every stream reach using the LIDAR information and that was incredibly helpful in conjunction with watershed attributes to extrapolate the field data throughout the whole Delaware River watershed. Next slide. This is a slide showing the field sites in the Chesapeake Bay as the little black stars on the Delaware River watershed. There are 67 sites um, sampling the various physiographic regions. Next. At each of these sites, the amount of sediment, long-term sediment storage on the floodplain was sampled by looking at how old the trees were and how much sediment had accumulated over their young roots. Next slide. In addition to this, the quantification of stream bank erosion over multiple decades was possible by taking cross sections of exposed roots and then interpreting the, those cross sections as to when those roots were first exposed to air. And um, that's kind of a complex process, but it's possible. And, and it was done at all of these sites. Next slide. And at each of those sites, each of those stars is represented by a separate bar in this chart. And you see the sediment deposition in blue, the top bar and the sediment erosion, namely from stream banks um, in the, the bottom kind of negative bar in red. And those were the data collected for sediment, carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen. Um, so we understood those fluxes at these various sites representing different physiographic provinces. And then we extrapolated them with watershed characteristics and LIDAR-based geomorphometry. Next. To do that, we built a tool called FACET, the Floodplain and Channel Evaluation Tool. Uh, this is a tool that's that's available. It's open source, Python driven, and it uses LIDAR to extract information about channels and floodplains. Next slide. So here you can see some of the information it extracts from channels. It generates a user-defined number of cross-sections, um, actually millions of cross-sections across the whole stream network in the Delaware and Chesapeake Bay watershed. And in each of those cross-sections, it locates the stream banks. And there's different approaches for doing that that are built into the tool. So in a sense, we're developing in the bottom left, the cross section in blue is what we've extracted from LIDAR and the overlay cross section in magenta is what was done in the field. So we're able to get a pretty good characterization of a lot of these streams. Next slide. In addition to the channel, we are also mapping floodplains and doing that with what's called the height above nearest drainage. So we're able to, in a sense, flood the landscape um, at different levels and find out where that water would go, how far out it would go from the stream uh, to represent the floodplain. And we're in the process of tying that information to stream gauge heights. So we can actually simulate you know, different recurrence interval floods. Next slide. So all this information is available online. It's on USGS's science base. You can, you can download all the uh, various metrics we've derived for the Delaware River watershed from this site. Um, it's a lot of information, uh, but it's all been published now and available to you. And we also have sites I'll be sharing in the future where you can download the code for the tool. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Peter. Fascinating data set. Next up, we have Thomas Amadon from the DRBC, and he'll be talking about the evaluation of the technical, economic, and social impacts associated with major watershed treatment infrastructure to address aquatic life uses and values in the Delaware estuary. Tom, please take it away. Sure, I was wondering how Peter was gonna get through all those slides in five minutes and he, <laughs> uh, he just showed us how that's done. Whew. Uh, my name's Tom, Tom Amadon, I'm a manager of water resources modeling at the Delaware River Basin Commission, uh, which I'm sure most of you know is an interstate compact with pretty broad authority to manage and protect water resources within the Delaware uh, basin. Next slide, please. 
uh, that title was provided to me, and uh, this is a simpler one that's really going to capture what we're going to talk about, and that is what it, what's it going to take to upgrade the uh, treatment plants within the Delaware estuary. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is part of a larger study that's being conducted by the DRBC uh, to evaluate the uh, designated aquatic life uses in uh, urban areas of the watershed. In particular, we're zooming in on a approximately 40 mile stretch from uh, that the captures Philadelphia and Camden area down to Wilmington. Uh, you can see the graph on the right here shows dissolved oxygen over time. Um, this is looking at July at the Ben Franklin Bridge and you can see the dramatic improvement in dissolved oxygen conditions that's occurred and that has prompted the agency to reevaluate the, desi the designation of aquatic life uses. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and what we know is that the DRBC water quality goals established in 1967 have been exceeded. Uh, this is great news. The, the dissolved oxygen now at the Ben uh, Franklin Bridge uh, exceeds three and a half milligrams per liter as a daily average. And uh, this section is currently uh, designated for maintenance only as opposed to maintenance and propagation of fish. Uh, but the fisheries have significantly improved as a result of this uh, dissolved oxygen improvement. And there's now some degree of fish propagation that is being observed in these maintenance only areas, particularly, like I said, this urban zone. Uh, so we also know that more oxygen will enhance the degree of fish propagation. So there's some now. And with more oxygen, we have every reason to believe, based on a number of previous studies, that there will be more. In fact, uh, we think that full propagation <clears throat> among the resident fish would appear to be supported uh, by a minimum DO, not an average DO, but a minimum DO of approximately five milligrams per liter. And that's, that's not a uh, criteria right now, but that's a, that's a number that's helpful as a frame of reference. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> what we need to determine and what we are about determining and what this study relates to that I'm sharing with you is what is the uh, highest attainable dissolved oxygen condition for this stretch of the, the estuary? What would the DO condition be under various levels of pollutant reductions? This is the subject of a significant modeling effort that we're involved with. And what would be the costs and benefits associated with the various source reductions? And I've underlined costs uh, because that's really really what I'm talking to you in the next three minutes about. Can you advance, please? <clears throat> advance this, yeah. Uh, so this study is, the, is a nitrogen reduction cost estimation study, and the key personnel involved here is actually my colleague at DRBC, John Yagachek, who manages the water quality assessment. He, he's managing this project and, uh, and the lead investigator with our, with our subcontractor, Kleinfelder, is Tim Bradley. Um, and the purpose of the study is really to estimate the cost to achieve specific nitrogen levels in treated discharges within, this, within the estuary. Uh, the study really had two components. It looked at generic plant costs in terms of uh, dollars per million gallon per day treated. And it also, uh, for the top 12 plants, looked at uh, an estimation of plant-specific costs. The status of this is that um, the study is completed. It's under review by the DRBC and our Advisory Committee for Water Quality. Uh, next slide, please. And this shows the findings, really, uh, which I'll walk through. Um, <clears throat> so the graph, uh, the generic plant capital costs were, as I mentioned before, estimated in terms of dollars per gallon per day treated for each affluent target and each plant type. Uh, next slide, please. That's going to bring in the next paragraph. So uh, <clears throat> we focused on four different effluent concentration levels. Uh, one is uh, 10, 10 milligrams per liter of ammonia which many of the treatment plants are meeting now, uh, but many are not. Uh, the second is five milligrams per liter of ammonia. The third is 1.5 milligrams per liter of ammonia, which is a pretty, pretty much representative of uh, 
the best that that uh, you can achieve with nitrification uh, within a treatment plan. And the fourth is actually more stringent, and that will be four milligram per liter of total nitrogen because <clears throat> it's actually more stringent than one and a half milligram per liter of ammonia because uh, when you, you the, the treatment plants reduce ammonia by oxidizing it to nitrate, so that uh, still results in in the same amount of total nitrogen. So um, to get you want reduce to wrap the, up in thirty yeah, seconds. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, thirty seconds. Yeah, no problem. Peter did it. Hell. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we also looked for the 12 largest plants. Uh, we, they were divided by the type of plant and a, a lot of cost factors went into this analysis. It was really pretty sophisticated. The graph shows um, on the bottom, the x-axis, the different effluent concentrations. And on the left, you have the total annual cost. Now that's a annual present value cost. It takes the capital cost, the operation and maintenance cost. Um, it assumes a loan and an annual amount amortized over. So, so and, and it's expressed in current dollars. And you can see that it's fairly linear for the ammonia reductions down to 1.5. And then there's a sharp increase uh, that would be necessary to achieve the TN target because there you'd have to add denitrification. Okay, with that, I think we're going to move on, Tom. <laughs> Hopefully. That's it. That's yeah. the whole slide. I'm ready to move on. Thanks. <laughs> So thanks. Hopefully we'll have more time to listen to you um, in October. So next up we have Claire Jantz, um, <clears throat> who is at Shippensburg University. She'll be discussing how forest ecosystems and hydrologic processes in the Delaware River Basin may be affected by climate change and land use cover. Claire, please take it away. Thanks and hello everyone. Um, I'm going to be uh, kind of giving a really broad overview of some of our key findings um, that have come out of this, this project, which is largely um, wrapped up except for a few papers still needing to be written. So let's go ahead and jump into the next slide. Um, what we did um, with this work was we took um, a suite of models, models of um, hydrology, a tree species distribution model um, and a water runoff model and coupled those with um, estimates of future land use change and climate change to generate a series of estimates of um, a bunch of different hydroclimatic variables. We looked at magnitude of future floods and droughts. Um, we looked at forest fragmentation and then how tree species distributions might be impacted. So in the next slide, um, we, uh, this focuses on the uh, climate data and the development of the hydro, of the gridded hydroclimatic um, model. And what we um, found here is that by the end of the century, uh, we might see annual temperature increases of two to five and a half degrees um, Celsius. Uh, we noted uh, um, increases in precipitation, rainfall, and runoff um, also increases in evapotranspiration, while at the same time, by the end of the century, we see an overall decrease in snowfall, snow melt, and subsurface moisture. What we're seeing on the slide is an image of, um, of, uh, <clears throat> of snow storage by the end of the century. Um, seasonally, that translates into summer subsurface moisture decreases of 7 to 18 percent, so um, more uh, um, uh, uh, severe droughts in the summer, and water runoff, winter runoff increases um, by 15 to 43 percent, um, largely driven by the decrease in snowfall. If we go to the next slide, um, we also looked at runoff in the context of changing climate and land use. Um, in this um, piece, we took five case study watersheds and parsed the impact of climate change um, by itself, the impact of land use change by itself, and then the synergistic effects of that. When we looked at climate change um, alone, um, given the increased precipitation, we saw an increase of up to 58% in peak flood discharge. Looking at land use alone, an increase of up to 10% peak flood discharge. And when we combine those two factors, we see up to a 66% increase in peak flood discharge and up to a 44% increase in runoff volume by the end of the century. If we look at 
what we found for um, tree species distributions. What we really focused on here was improving um, tree species distribution models by coupling it with the um, hydro um, climate model. And what we found here is that um, the hydro meteorological outputs from the hydroclimatic model, especially um, metrics related to energy, um, improve species distribution models, likely because those variables are more relevant for um, the trees themselves. Next slide. Um, looking at land use and uh, land use change and energy infrastructure development on um, forest fragmentation, urbanization and energy infrastructure development are forecasted to be the biggest drivers of land use change in the future. Um, and when we're analyzing forest fragmentation across um, a heterogeneous landscape like the Delaware River Basin, the challenge is trying to make comparisons um, between areas that differ a lot in terms of forest abundance and in terms of fragmentation patterns. So we actually developed a new metric that allows us to compare um, actual fragmentation compared to expected fragmentation. Um, and using this metric, we parsed out the difference or the impacts of land use change, which is what you see in the right hand image here, um, and energy infrastructure, which is what you see on the left hand um, image in terms of how those two develop drivers of land use change would impact um, forest fragmentation. Um, I've noted in the um, slides here that both future climate scenarios in terms of precip and temperature and future land use scenarios are now available for visualization and analysis in Model My Watershed. Um, and we'll also be releasing, hopefully within the next week or so, um, a big data package of our land use change scenarios. Thank you. Great, thank you, Claire. Moving on, next up, we have Stephanie Kroll from the Academy of Natural Sciences. She'll talk, be, be talking about setting targets for DRWI stream improvement. Steph, take it away. Thank you. Um, so I guess I wanna start with just acknowledging all my collaborators and the people who've contributed to this and the support of the William Penn Foundation. And then of course, um, Marie, who is our moderator here. Uh, thanks, okay, next slide. And so um, our role in the DRWI is to help show the you know, effects of the on the ground actions, but this is still a really new field and in a developing area of data and of research. And so um, when you think about what should the system look like that guides the actions that are taken, you wanna base it on existing data and you wanna inform it with relevant research. So the actions in the DRWI are mainly agricultural and stormwater best management practices and land preservation. And then this quote by Margaret Palmer just talks about, you wanna have a guiding image of what a more dynamic and healthy river would look like. Um, next slide, please. And so in this paper, what we wanted to know was what is out there in the research to show the effects of agricultural best management practices on the stream chemistry and on the insects and fish and um, diatoms in the stream. Next slide. And what we found was that the studies had these really wide ranges. So if you think about the ones for livestock, keeping them out of the stream, putting in buffers, um, there was an eight to 85% reduction in night total nitrogen. And so you can just see these ranges are huge and um, they're huge across all categories. And that's because, you know, the land that people are working on, the conditions of their best management practices, just vary very widely. So it's logical, but it's definitely posing a challenge to us in setting targets for what the stream should look like. And if we um, go back to Les Mesa's um, triangle of chain, of um, pyramid of indicators, you know, that water chemistry and below that, the morphology, all of those add up. So. Those are the clues we're tracking down. Um, next slide, please. So we're looking a lot at the biota with the chemistry and the habitat. Um, so just metrics are things that we count, we get from count data, you know, count data is just how many of each different uh, creature are you observing? Um, so metrics describe the structures, you can have percent mayflies, percent stoneflies, the favorite EPT, which is the sensitive mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. 
So that's the structure. And then the ecological function is where do they live? What do they eat, et cetera. Um, metrics are great for simplifying the data, but it loses information. And then we really have been finding that different indicators, so fish, habitat, chemistry, macroinvertebrates, tell different pieces of the story. And this resilience piece is underlined because we just really don't know about how the streams are gonna return in terms of resilience. Next slide, please. So here is just for macroinvertebrates, when we can compare the assessment with metrics and the assessment with counts, we find that they're most similar in the area in the middle where the lowest value of Procrustes distance. So those middle agricultural sites, the two align very well, but on the edges where they're highly forested or highly agricultural, the metrics disagree with the counts. Next slide, please. And for diatoms, we found that in the forested regions, there's a lot of agreement, but as you get down into the more degraded site, there's, sorry, the opposite. In forested sites, they don't agree. But if you go down into the more degraded sites, they do agree. And so this is just a caution to relying too heavily on metrics used in state protocols when they actually tell very different stories about the site's integrity. Next slide, please. So we are looking at this from so many different objectives. The committee that I assembled originally, this is my last slide. The committee I assembled originally, um, when we talked about setting targets, you know, some people on the committee were like, we can't do it, that's not possible. So we're just really working to approach this from different sides to say which indicators are working best, which information is most useful. So for this one, those um, black dots show where along our environmental gradient you find these macroinvertebrates. And you can see groups of them tend to like drop off and change along the gradient while others tend to appear. And so we'll be doing more at the conference and thank you. Great, thank you, Steph. And last but not least, we have Lynn Perez, um, also from the Academy of Natural Sciences. Lynn will be talking about new approaches to high resolution agricultural BMP modeling in the Delaware River watershed. Lynn, please take it away. Thanks, Marie. Um, let's jump to the next slide. Um, so the work that I'll be presenting on today is a collaborative effort between um, the Academy of Natural Sciences and the Drexel College of Computing and Informatics. We work together, we collaborate very regularly, and we call ourselves the Drexel Environmental Data Science Group. Um, the overall project objective um, for this work is, is rooted um, within the DRWI and uh, specifically what we call project impact assessment. Some of the folks that presented today were, were um, you know, get talking about the work that they've done in the context of project impact assessment. The work that, um, that I'll be discussing here um, looks specifically to quantifying the impacts of uh, restoration efforts and specifically um, capital investments that have been made by NIFWF or the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, the overall objective of this work is to do estimates and reductions of total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and total suspended solids for BMPs um, that have been installed using a spatially exp explicit modeling approach. Um, so this, this modeling approach that we, that we developed is, um, it's been implemented inside of a user interface or a website called FieldDoc. Many of you I'm sure have used it, some have not. Um, so we, in, we implemented our work or our model um, through what we call an API. An API is an application programming interface and it essentially allows that model to be accessible to whoever um, would like to use it. So within that API, we currently have 55 BMPs available. The BMPs that we um, decided to focus on were based off of the most com commonly implemented BMPs that are used inside of FieldDoc and the Chesapeake Bay program. Um, those BMPs fall within seven generalized archetypes. Those archetypes are agricultural animal, stream restoration, urban stormwater management, land use change, agricultural land, um, polygon drainage, and then exclusion buffer. I'm going to focus just a little bit today on the polygon drainage archetype. Next slide. Okay, so we deployed this model in two watersheds. The first was the Chesapeake, the second was the Delaware River Basin. I won't get into the details of the Chesapeake Bay Basin today and we'll focus primarily on the work that we did in the Delaware River Basin. The data sources and models that we uh, used for our work was USGS high resolution data set, which is working off of a 10 meter 
working on 10 meter resolution. We use digital, digital elevation models, uh, flow direction raster. We base it all of our work off of the National Land Cover data set for, that's derived from 2011. Um, the, the general like model framework is working off of GWLFE, which is the generalized watershed loading, func loading function enhanced model, which is the same model that's used inside of uh, model my watershed. Um, and then lastly, we, in terms of like contextualizing um, how, to, how to actually calculate BMP specifically, we looked at Chesapeake Bay program and PADEP BMP efficiency coefficients. Next slide. So before I get into um, how we actually implement, um, how, how users actually uh, utilize our, our API service, I should say that the high resolution um, modeling portion of our API is based off of two specific algorithms. The first is the watershed uh, delineation. It's the watershed delineation API. We just call it the watershed API for short. It's based off of the watershed marching algorithm. The general, um, the general framing here is um, that at a given pore point, um, so at a, at a selected point in a watershed, a user, a user defines, we, rather than, um, rather than accessing every single, um, rather than access, ac accessing, sorry, I'm stuttering, rather than accessing every single um, grid within, grid cell within a flow direction grid, we um, skirt around the outside. So traditional um, algorithms that are typically deployed will visit every single cell in order to define what falls within a given watershed. Our algorithm, our algorithm skirts around the outside um, by using what we call a modified nested set um, algorithm. It's based off of a D8 flow direction grid. Um, here on the right, we are looking at a graph that um, kind of breaks down the complexity of um, a watershed delineation. So the top dots um, are looking at a typical uh, watershed delineation using traditional methods. Um, what you see here is those, the question that you ask for a watershed delineation, the complexity gets, the, gets complex very quickly. Whereas with our marching algorithm, algorithm complexity, um, when, you, when you go around the outside, you're asking a lot less questions. What this means in terms of like general application um, for a user, um, just to kind of give some context, we have the ability to delineate the Delaware River watershed in about three seconds. So in terms of like, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Wrap up in 30 seconds. Yeah, sure. In terms of runtime, it just, it, it means a lot for um, the user. Next slide. Uh, next, the next API that we deploy here is what we call a fast zonal API for a given selected area of interest. So for a user, this could be um, an area where you're deploying a BMP. We have an ability to calculate the information inside of a polygon of interest very quickly. Next slide. Um, <laughs> looking to what it actually means. So this is an example that I'm, I'll quickly run through here of a riparian forest buffer analysis. So a user comes into field doc which is the user interface, defines where they're doing their work. It sends an API request to our service. Um, from there, we define the HUC12 and the loading rate associated with um, where that work is happening. We calculate the watershed um, for the BMP polygon using our watershed API. We then run the statistics using our fast zonal API. We calculate the um, pollutant reduction loads associated with that given API using the specific coefficients. Um, for that BMP, BMP of interest. And then we send that information back to the user. Um, so we send the reduction coefficients um, associated with that BMP, the watershed that's actually delineated so that you can see uh, the area of, of interest um, and any information that comes along with that. Look, next slide, looking ahead, um, what this actually means, we focused on, on, on agricultural BMPs and in the future we'll be focusing on urban BMPs at a high resolution as well. Thank you all. Great. Um, and with that, that is our eight speakers for today. Thank you all for keeping this in the lightning format. Um, we hope that you will, um, oh, actually, Olivia, can we get the slide back up? Sorry. <laughs> um, there we go. Yeah, just so we have. Um, so I, we have about, oh, I'd say five, well, like eight minutes or so for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, I believe, unless Olivia wants to correct me, you can raise your hand and um, she'll be able to call on you. Or if you want to just pop it in the chat and I can read it out loud. If you do put it in the chat, please tell me which speaker you would like that you direct this to. 
Um, so do we have any hands raised to start, Olivia? If not- Certainly no hand raised. Okay. I'll certainly start out with one. Peter, I'm curious, is there any plans to take um, your modeling efforts in the Chesapeake and the Delaware and expand that to other watersheds in the US? Um, yes, uh, so we, right now, uh, you know, we developed parameters that are, the model is kind of parameterized in terms of the, um, you know, cross-section length and, and height above nearest drainage and stuff by physio physiographic province, looking at the four physiographic provinces that are dominant in the Chesapeake and the Delaware. But we're trying to automate that whole process of parameterization of the model based on more localized landscape characteristics. So the model in the future will be able to derive these characteristics of kind of local land form and then interpret what the parameters should be um, for setting up the model in, in any area in the conterminous US. That's the objective. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. We'll look forward to that. Any questions from the audience? I encourage you to think of some. <laughs> Put me on the spot here. No. Um, I'd say while we're waiting, and I have a few, but to not hog the space, is there any sort of last, I know this was a lightning session, any last points that any of the speakers particularly want to focus on or emphasize or questions you had? No. So Steph, in some of your work, what have you noticed um, looking at the different species? What are some of the, is there any sort of particular surprise in some of the results that you've had so far in terms of which species um, indicators, either in terms of which ones appear or disappear with changes in water quality? Um, yeah, I think we all know there's like a wide world of midges where you have a midge for every flavor of water chemistry. So. That's been not surprising, but I think there's a lot of interesting information in there. I think there are definitely some taxa that I always thought um, were indicative of healthier streams that I'm finding in the more degraded streams. So I think either the, the tolerance values we're using aren't updated. Well, it's probably that, but maybe the biota just have a wider range than we expect, even if they're often present um, so there's just one fly called Antocha that I always thought would be. And then I guess sometimes it's confusing because something might be a burrower in sand habitats, um, but they still prefer good water quality, but they might take sand where there's bad water quality because there's not a lot of sand in a nice riffly headwater stream. So those sometimes can be surprising. Great. Let's see. Claire? Yeah. Yeah, um, I have a question for um, Nancy. Um, I was wondering when you were looking at, so my understanding of what you've done is that you have data from 2007 and then you sort of did a new round of data collection and looked at um, the changes that you saw um, in the muskinecton. Um, I'm wondering in terms of what you found for um, decreases in um, fecal bacteria relative to animals and the increase in the human load. Did you also track animal and human population change over that same time period? Uh, yes, there were questions that was part of the interview process is we really needed to understand, for example, herd size in a agricultural setting can be have a big impact or just changing the type of animal you have you know in one case there was a, a beef and then it went to or, or dairy and then it went to water buffalo which is not a species that we would capture in this so there may be things that were missing i think what was more interesting was this low hum of human bacteria that seemed to be much more prevalent. Uh, that was that was sort of took us, I guess, by surprise in a way. Any last questions? I think if not, we'll move on. Next slide, Olivia. 
So we hope that you all enjoyed these research talks today, um, and we encourage you to mark your calendars for Thursday, October 22nd. Um, the Academy will be hosting their fourth annual Delaware River Watershed Conference, research conference. All of the speakers that you heard today will be given giving a little bit longer, 15 minutes or traditional conference talks there, so you can learn more about their work. Um, we'll also be having some additional speakers who weren't represented here today. So take this as your teaser trailer, and we hope to see you again on October 22nd. I do believe Tanya has nicely put a link in the chat um, with the e or the Evite Eventbrite, sorry, information for that conference. Um, the link is also shown here as well to register. So please do join us. We look forward to hearing more about this research and some other presentations. And with that, next slide. I think we have a next slide. Maybe not. Um, if we don't, then I, well, yeah, I thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much to the speakers. A fascinating um, eight talks. I really enjoyed them. And we hope um, you enjoy the rest of the conference and I'll let you go with a couple minutes to take a breath before you go on to the next session. Unless Olivia, you've got any last announcements.